Hi guys, welcome all to my presentation about monitoring and observability in a serverless system. We're going to slay this guy, huh, the monitoring monster. That's what the, talk, uh, the topic of the talk was about. Um, so we are already, uh, let me go back to the beginning, we're already three days or two or three days into the conference. So who's still awake? Like, okay, if your neighbor didn't put his hand up, so just give him a punch. <laughs> Right, okay, so uh, serverless monitoring and observability um, by uh, Nick van Oof. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to. Um, before we're talking about that, let's talk a little bit about me. I'm Nick van Hoof. I'm a cloud developer. That just means that I'm doing all of my work uh, with cloud native stuff. Um, I work for Ordina Belgium, which is a consultancy company. And yeah, consultancy, it's actually, I'm actually a developer, so I consult, but I'm a developer all the time at another company then. Um, and you can find some of my better work at our Blordina blog, blogs and some of my playground work at my own website. All right, so let's get started with serverless monitoring and observability. And uh, let's see uh, what you guys can do to make uh, your life easier when working with serverless applications in the cloud. Because mm, imagine that you are the guy that this week you do the third line support. So if something is really wrong in production, there's a production issue, they will call you. But yeah, of course, you always think they will never call, they will not call. Uh, so you're just chilling away in your hammock on a Saturday, um, laying there and then, oh my God, the phone rings. And you know this monster is about to come out because it's so hard always to find the problems in your landscape. Um, so let's now see how we can make your life easier and, and make you go back to your hammock. All right, um, how am I going to build up my story? I'm just going to quickly touch on a few topics about serverless. Uh, serverless is a new kit on the block. What are the characteristics that are important for our talk right now? And um, what are the challenges that come with it? And that's also the second and the main part of the presentation. So some of those new challenges, what are those challenges and how do we tackle them? Um, and then we shortly go into uh, third-party tools as an alternative for what I'm actually saying here. Now, if you want to know more, because I'm going to give you a lot of handles, a lot of tools that you can use to make your life better, of course, all of these topics might be a session on its own. So if you really want to go deeper into this, I also wrote a blog post where I go much deeper into the technical queries and the, the code behind it. Um, which is behind these links or either one of those, th they will all lead you there. Right. So uh, let's get started with the first part, serverless as a new normal. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you, you are already here for, uh, for two days, so you have heard a, a lot of characteristic characteristics about serverless already. And me, I just want to point out one that's important for our presentation here, and that's the scalability. Mm, because now we are working with uh, Google with Cloud Functions or with um, AWS Lambda, as I will be here. And instead of one guy who is working for us, when a request comes in and, and one application that's working, we now have multiple of these guys all working together for us at the same time. Hmm. That's what we know as um, the, the serverless, the concurrency. So if a lot of requests come in, then uh, the same code, so the logic that we want to execute, will be executing at the same time um, together. That's, what it, that's why it's scalable, uh, that's the Lambda concurrency. Um, and that's an issue that we will also meet later in the talk, which I want to mention. So those are the theoretical advantages. If people ask me, like Nick, why is serverless so important for you? Um, well, serverless, it enables the power of the cloud. That's what it does to me. And that's because you can really work in a DevOps way, people, um, creating their own databases, uh, writing the serverless code, pushing it to production rather quickly, and then um, giving the support for it too. So you're really managing the whole thing, but with, a, uh, with great power comes, of course, also great responsibility, so you have to manage it right. Um, and also, touch, I already touched on that, yeah. so you define your environment as infrastructure as code, typically, which allows you to very quickly spin up the same infrastructure in one region and then in the other region, or just as a developer, I, I'm creating some new stuff. Well, I'm just spinning up my whole application um, on a developer node because actually all the infrastructure is defined and very quickly we can deploy uh, the same thing again. 
So we can have shorter times to production, at least if we, we do this right. And that's what we want because we want to be implementing business value. We want to we want to quickly deliver. And, and that's why I think serverless for the right use cases, um, it's a great fit. OK, now getting closer to the actual topic. Um, this is a typical Lambda landscape, a typical Lambda landscape. Actually, it's a rather small landscape. Uh, I've seen uh, landscapes with uh, tens of services in it. Now we see about 10 Lambda functions putting something in a database, uh, putting files on an S3 bucket, or having a fan out pattern. And all those things, they can start working based on one call that came in via the API. So things are not happening in one place anymore. When we, like when we build a monolithic application, no, things are happening at multiple places at the same time. Um, and so I also built a small application um, to use uh, while doing this demo. Uh, and I also want to get you acquainted with this. So um, this is a conference application. So imagine, or imagine that you're on a conference, which is not that hard because you already are. Um, and people, they can create, uh, we also want to organize this conference next year. And people, they can create speakers, they can come to us and they can create a new session. So and they can come and send a session in via the API, and then we will store that session in the database. And then other speakers, they don't want to submit the same session. You want to see what's already there. You could, so you can fetch all of these sessions via the API too. And on top of that, if we make a new session, then um, a Slack notification will be sent out like, hey, guys, a new session was entered. So uh, click here, and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, click there. This is the application. This is the front end, the small front end that I built for it. The application is actually the back end behind this. So I, and yeah, you saw, you see one topic appearing here already, which is the talk that I gave yesterday. That's the database already. Now, I want to add a new uh, session. So I'm going to add something about monitoring serverless. Oh, caps lock, monitoring serverless. OK, and it's by Nick. So I'm submitting the session. And now actually, yeah, we see it takes quite a while because I'm expecting a, a pop-up. Um, yeah, there it is, finally. So uh, that's the cold start time. I wrote this thing in Java, and Java has quite a long cold start time. That's not the main topic here, but it's, it's important that to know for you, you're not paying anything if you're not using anything. And with serverless, you can scale to zero. But then the moment that the first request comes in, yeah, the system has to uh, cold start, because the Lambda is not working. Um, it has to start up, so the first time it takes a little more time. Um, and now for, for the sake of the argument, let's just add one more. Uh, I saw something about Firebase. It was by Michael, it's like that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so now you'll see that we will have an answer already faster. See, the pop-up is faster. And it's already, um, it's not in the database yet. Let me refresh the page. Yeah, it's there because we're doing this asynchronously. That's why it took some time. OK, so this is the happy flow that you now know uh, how it should work if everything goes well. And uh, what we did was we created a session via the API. And along the way, we passed some milestones. And milestones, pay attention to that word, because I'm going to come back to that. We're also going to see those milestones in the logs later on. So uh, a request came in, and we received that request. Then we validated that request, and we pushed it to the topic, which pushed it further to the queue. Um, and then we actually uh, saved it in the database. So we will also find this milestone in the logs. Like it's correctly saved in the database. If we pass this milestone, we know that our story has reached the point where the session is saved. And if the notification is sent out, uh, we will have some, a log saying the a milestone passing the notification has been sent. Actually, I didn't show you that notification yet, so let's go to my Slack. Let's see if we got a notification. Indeed, here in our Slack channel, we see that we got two new sessions that were added, uh, the one about monitoring serverless and about Firebase. We got, as we expected, the uh, notification. So. Let's now dive into the challenges and the problems that might appear here. Because we know, uh, um, we know that this is the flow that we will follow. We now are familiar with this flow. But what if it goes wrong? Where did it go wrong? Uh, we have multiple parts working together. So observability becomes a challenge because we have to observe multiple places at once. Um, and uh, it can also go wrong in multiple places at once. 
So for example, there might be something wrong sending out a Slack notification or storing the, the session in the database. That is a real error appearing something in the code. Now, another thing, another challenge that might arrive is that along the way here, we have a performance bottleneck somewhere. Something isn't performing as we expected, it, it is performing slowly. So we want to search for the poorly performing parts of our application. And then the third thing is uh, we have a landscape uh, that exists of so many cloud services that we are not able to run locally, um, or at least it's not easy to run the whole landscape locally. So we want to test if we make some changes to the code, is our application still working as expected? So we want to put it under some load. We want to flood it with a lot of requests and then see if the system is still behaving as we expect. So uh, first challenge was where did it go wrong? If it goes wrong, where do we find the error in the distributed system? Second challenge was, can we find the performance bottlenecks that are poorly performing in our system? And the third one is, if you make some changes, um, is, it still is the system still working as we expect? And can it handle the load that we expect? Right, so let's get into this. Let's deal with those challenges because that's what we do. We are developers and we look for solutions. The first one was finding the error in the distributed system. So, uh, okay, I have a lot of slides, but a lot of the same slides. So, <laughs> where did it go wrong? Um, let's make the bomb go off somewhere in our landscape. And because we know the happy flow, we're expecting a select notification for this. So let me create a new session about Spring Cloud Function. Also a new thing, something fancy, something that I want to talk about. Okay, so I submit it. Mm, okay, I see I got an answer for that. So that, that went correctly. It was taken in by the system. Oh, um, let me try that again. Spring, because I was supposed to copy something here. Um, Nick, so up, uh, and I'm going to copy this uh, here. This is just, yeah, this is a session that should be created. The idea of the session that should be created. Um, but as we now refresh the page, and let me just save that idea to be sure. Yeah, we refresh the page. We, sh we should see something here, a session about Spring Cloud Function. No, it's not there yet. Okay, maybe, maybe take some time. The system is working asynchronously. Still, it's not there, all right? Something might be wrong here. Did we actually get a Slack notification for this thing? No, we didn't. Still, the last one is still the Firebase one that we added, and nothing is here about our um, new session about Spring Cloud Functions. So somewhere along the way, it went wrong. And we now need to figure out where. I'm expecting <laughs> you surely want uh, this guy to explode now, but it won't. Um, right. What we should see is still that happy flow where we pass all those milestones and we get a request to create something, we validate that request, we save that in the database, we pass all these milestones and we send out a Slack notification. But now clearly not all of these milestones, we haven't passed them all because um, we, we didn't get the Slack notification. Somewhere along the way it went wrong. Right, um, what do we need when a bomb goes off? Suppose that a bomb goes off in your neighborhood, what do you want? I guess that you want to be alerted, right? You want to be notified. Um, same thing here. If something happens in my serverless landscape, I want to be notified. I want to know that it went wrong. So how can we do this? Um, well, we can do this with an AWS service which is called CloudWatch Alarms. For the people who don't know CloudWatch, CloudWatch, the name says it all. It's a, it's a service that's responsible for, for watching your cloud. So at this point, it has been watching the cloud and it has seen that an error event has appeared. So it picked up the event and then published, published a message to a, to a topic somewhere um, which we are listening on with a Lambda function that is responsible for alerting us. Not going into the code behind this, also uh, in the resource that I will link uh, afterwards. But we should have gotten an alert by now and I've been talking for a while so I guess that alert will already be there. Let's see. Hmm. Always when we see this guy, I will be performing a demo. Um, so fingers crossed. Uh, right, going to, and yes, it is already lighting up. Huh? My alerts channel right here. We see that we got uh, an alarm here uh, saying that yeah, two sessions uh, were added, uh, two errors appeared somewhere while saving uh, an item in the database. 
Now, this is a pretty unclear error message, if you ask me. And this is the one that I just took from um, the AWS. Uh, they have like a, a couple of templates that you can use to send a Slack notification, and I didn't uh, change the content of it. But if you want it, you could also add uh, the session ID here, get some more information about what went wrong, so that you already have more to, to start from. At least we know that something went wrong because we got an alarm. Oh yeah, and we can also see this in CloudWatch. So if I go to my alarms, we already see yeah, one guy went red here, and that is the same alarm. Yeah, let me refresh the page. It's that same alarm saying that something went wrong. The one that we also got um, the message for in Slack. Right, back to the presentation. Mm -hmm. We got notified. There's an error in the landscape. What do we do now? Yeah, if something goes wrong, we want to know what. We always check the logs, right? So mm, let's look at how does the logging work uh, for the Lambda functions here. Well, uh, we have that, that story uh, that is being told. We have all those milestones that we should see in the logs. Because the logging actually, uh, it tells us a story. It tells us the story of what's happening in our Lambda function. And now the logging here for Lambda, it actually it tells a story. But the story isn't told in one place anymore. I already mentioned that. It is told in multiple places. Yeah, we first get a request, then we try to save it, then we try to send out a Slack notification. So the logs are coming from multiple places. Um, yeah, logging tells a story. Now, we also saw that we have that scalability. Hmm? Those many minions that were working for us, they can all be working at the same time. So many, uh, Many uh, Lambda functions might be working concurrently, all producing logs here at the same time. So we need to filter out uh, or at least know which of these logs are actually important for our request, the Spring Cloud function that we try to create. And the logs are coming from multiple different places, so we need something to correlate them together. We need something to link the logs that, so that we know that are important to us. And that's what I'm repeating here. So logging tells a story. Logging might now actually tell many stories at once because we have the Lambda concurrency. And the story, the, the parts of the story are told in different places. Mm. So that's a distributed system that we have. All right, uh, there's the same, the same thing again. The milestones that we should see coming from different Lambda functions, all producing logs that we should correlate, that we should aggregate, in which we should look. So, um, logging poses some challenges right now because we, uh, I told you, the logging contains information. We want to get that information out of our logs. Now, information is data. If we want to have data, if we, we want to get the data, it would be very nice if we ju could just query data, like, uh, right? So, same thing as if we are querying a database. We want to be able to query our logs. The other challenge is that the logs are coming from multiple different places, so we want to aggregate them together and we want to link them together to know the logs that are actually important to us. So we need to aggregate them and we need to correlate them together. And yeah, next slide. Behold, structured logging, structured logging to the rescue. Now, oh, my mic, I'm losing my mic. Right, what is structured logging? It will help us it will offer us all of those solutions that we need. Let's look at a normal log. Yeah? We all recognize this, just a long string uh, with a timestamp here and then a message uh, in the end. And for, for us, yeah, okay, a human, a human can read this. For a computer, this is just like one line of text, just a string. If you kind of want to get some information out of this, we, should, we have to write some regexes. Um, and then if we change the log, then the regex doesn't work anymore and the dashboards go down. So this is not machine readable. We're actually willing to log this uh, in a way that we can understand it as well as the machine. So now I'm going to show you the structured log, which will be a lot more bloated. Huh? It's the same thing actually. We still see that message right here. We still see the timestamp. But we also see a lot of other stuff which is actually good because that's some extra contextual information that we could use. We see that it is a JSON format. 
So the computer is able to interpret this for us um, and to extract the information. I already told you timestamp and message are in there. Now we also see something called the AWS request ID. And that request ID, that's something on AWS that uniquely identifies an execution, an invocation of a Lambda function. So this invocation is uniquely identified by this UUID. What else do we see here? We see contextual information like the log group and the function name. We know that this log is coming from this Lambda function, the one that is saving the stuff in our database. Right? We also see that famous milestone that I was talking about. So if we see this in the log, we know that it was actually saved in the database. And then last, but certainly not least, we see the trace ID. And this is the thing that we will use to link all those logs together. Huh? Remember, I told you we have logs coming from different places and we need to correlate them. We need to know which logs have something to do with each other. And that's what we will use this trace ID for. So, and the trace ID, things, an, a session arriving via the API in the first Lambda function, we execute some log logic there, we create a trace ID, and we forward that trace ID through our landscape. So then when we arrive in the second Lambda function, we take that trace ID and we also add it to our logs so that we recognize that it, is, it has something to do with the same transaction, the same thing that was triggered by the request coming, coming in over here. Again, we forward it further in our landscape. We can correlate things with our trace ID. So structured logging will allow us to query our logs. It allows us to add some extra contextual data to our logs, like those milestones we saw, and the milestone, the key that was in, in the JSON format. And um, it allows us to add a trace ID to the logs. Now, I can tell you this, but I also want to show you. And so we will show the, um, we will, I will show it in a few minutes. Um, and I will use a service for that saying, um, named CloudWatch Logs Insights. And that's a service that, again, what's in a name, gives us some insights into our logs. AWS describes it as CloudWatch Log Insights enables you to analyze and visualize your logs. And they say like instantaneously, but it's not completely instantaneously. The data sometimes it takes a couple of minutes to be processed by the machine. Right, so let's see it now. Let's look for our error. And I'm going to CloudWatch uh, for this. Um, going here. Here. Um, here I am in Logs Insights. And we immediately recognize here to the right um, the AWS request ID, the function name, all those keys that were in our structured logs. So I didn't have to write any regexes right now. This was automatically picked up by AWS. Um, they know that there's some information here that's important. Um, we then see that we can write a query over here. Hmm? So here I'm actually saying, give me the fields, give me the milestones, give me the function name that was executing, and give me the timestamp at which this event appears. So here I did this for a happy flow uh, where I said like for this trace ID, I want to search all the logs that have something to do with this trace ID, and I want to find uh, the milestones. And then just sort them beginning with the thing that, that appeared first. So here we see that this session here was added correctly. Um, uh, we, we got a request to, uh, we, we received a session. We then later, we tried to persist it. We actually persisted it. And uh, we send out a Slack notification. Happy flow going well. Let's now look for the one, the Spring Cloud function that should have been created and that is not created. So then the first thing I need to know now is um, what is my trace ID? The thing that links all of my logs together, I need to search that. And, and I only have my session ID right now. I know that there was supposed to be a session created with this session ID, but it wasn't created. I guess it wasn't created because we didn't get a Slack notification for it. So let me run this query. Right, and this is our trace ID. This is the thing that we need to link all of the logs together that have something to do with the creation of the Spring Cloud function session. So I'm copying that trace ID, and I can now um, paste it in the other query. 
allowing me to fetch all data out of our logs, all milestones out of our logs for this trace. Oh, let's give it some time. Yeah, there it is. Okay. We still see what we saw just before. We still see that the request has been received, has been validated, it has been pushed to the topic. Our first lambda function has been executed correctly. Now, then we got to the, the second lambda function, uh, this one here, and we see that we received a request to persist this thing, but we never see the milestone where we say, like, hey, it's correctly saved to the database. No, instead what we see is, uh, we see that we uh, got a request to persist this three times. And this is um, the cloud uh, trying for us to get this thing done and retrying two times and then just saying, okay, I give up. I tried three times. It's not working. So something went wrong here and we know where it went wrong. We see that it was never saved in this Lambda function. So let's now, um, again, uh, we can query for this because we have our structured logs. Let's take that Lambda function, that function name and add it to our query. By the way, if you want to know more about these queries, I'm all, uh, that's also in the resources, because the query language in itself, Cloud Patch Log Insights, it's a session by itself. Um, so I'm not going too deep into the query language right here. Um, and now we will find all the logs. Uh, actually, I don't want to see the milestones anymore. I just want to see all the logs, all the messages that uh, this thing has logged. So let's run that query and let's see what comes out. And these are all rocks that appeared. This is that execution, so it looks kind of bloated here. Um, but we immediately see that, oh god, indeed, an exception occurred here. So if I open this log, yep, and I see yeah, we have found our culprit. An exception has appeared, and it appeared at line 150 in the code. It actually appeared in the method mocking issues. So yeah, you got me, that's me. I made it go wrong. That's some custom code that I put there. But we found the place where it went wrong. And that's what we want. Eh? We want to use our logs to uh, be able to extract that information, to visualize our flow, uh, and to find where it went wrong. So, yes, um, we were able to query our logs because we had structured logs. That's very structured logs. Uh, yeah, I can't stress it enough, but there's really a need for structured logs because you can do so many things uh, while whilst you have while you have them. Um, we and the, the structured logs they allowed CloudWatch to pick up the fields automatically from our logs, and then we were able to query them, and we were even able to query them the mul uh, multiple log groups at once. So logs coming from different Lambda functions, we did one query and we searched them all. Um, so the first challenge, where did it go wrong? Yes, we found that. We saw that there was an exception on the way. We got a notification for that, which is also something that we want. And we used structured logging uh, that was aggregated and um, that we then used to correlate all of our logs and that we used to query and look through the logs, find information from our logs. Right. That was the first challenge. How many challenges do you have? We had three. But that was already the biggest challenge. Mm. So going on to the next one. As I said, we also want to find the performance bottlenecks in our system. We want to see which part of our flow is performing poorly. So our flow, uh, what we, um, our flow, we know our flow, the flow uh, getting the request, saving the request, sending out the notification. And we will use a service for this called AWS X-Ray. And we, most of you might know, the AWS icons, they are mostly kind of abstract and you don't really know what, you, what they mean from seeing the icon, but here you actually see the X, so that means that it's X-Ray. Um, right, with X-Ray, what can you do with X-Ray? It allows you to understand the behavior of your application. And if you understand the behavior, yeah, then you can analyze the performance of that application. And it does this by visualizing the behavior, and we will see that in a second. Um, so we have our flow, our normal flow, where we get a request and we send out a notification. But now there might be something in this flow that is holding us back, that is performing poorly, and actually, yeah, there is something here. Using our structured logs, 
I was able to write a query that visualizes the lead time. And what do I mean with that? That's actually the time when I submit a session till the time that a notification is sent out for this session. And we see that it takes us up to 10 seconds, even when the Lambda functions are hot. Um, so that should be, for 10 seconds for a computer, that's way too much time. Something is definitely wrong here. We have to dive into that. Now, I will not go with you into the console, because that would lead us very far. Um, I've gone in there eh, last night and took uh, the snapshots for you. Now, I see that the lines here are actually pretty small. So this is the visualization from X-Ray. X-Ray shows us the flow of our application, and this is the flow of the Slack notification being sent out. Um, um, and you, you immediately see that also something went wrong here. So it gives us uh, the, the transaction, of part of the transaction of our flow is visualized. With X-Ray, you will not be able to see the whole transaction from the beginning where the request came in till the end that we send out a Slack notification because X-Ray at this moment, it doesn't allow you to uh, make transactions over things that happen asynchronously. So it cannot trace over the SNS topic or over the DynamoDB that we saw in our flow. We cannot trace over that. That will be a new trace. Hi, Aerith. Um, so distributed tracing with X-Ray. Um, wait, I have the, the wrong title here, I see, because I'm not wrapping up right now. Uh, Let's look at the create lambda function. So if I have uh, the visualization, we can click this thing. And if we click it, we see the response distribution of our lambda function. This is some good information right here. We see that there were a couple of requests taking up three, four seconds. Yeah, those are our cold starts probably, uh, that which, takes, uh, which take a lot of time to get the lambda function started. But then once the function is started, uh, we see that they execute pretty fast a uh, couple of hundreds of milliseconds. So the problem isn't there. 100 milliseconds, that, that is not what we are looking for. We are looking something in terms of seconds. Um, if you then go deeper into this, so you click here, then you can even go, you can dive into your traces and you can really see in this lambda function, well, which different parts, what, what different parts, what different segments are happening there. And here we see that we validated the request, and that took us 98 milliseconds. OK. Then we put it to the SNS topic, um, 39 milliseconds, also not a lot. And we return the response to our client. We want to be sure to return the right response. So we also validate that, and that took 100 milliseconds. The problem isn't there. Let's look at our function that actually saves in the dynam DynamoDB. Up, there's this one. Uh, I click again the lambda function, the visualization. I clicked in the visualization again, and we see here, OK, these ones, those are the cold starts, which is normal that they take a long time. But then we see that even all of the requests uh, with the lambda functions that all were already warm, they still take at least three seconds. So we found a performance bottleneck here. Something here is taking a lot of time. And that is, uh, we can then dive even further into it, looking at an execution of our Lambda function, we see that we first had to cache some trace data somewhere, but that only uh, cost us 25 milliseconds. And then here we're actually saving, we're actually saving in the database, which cost us 9 milliseconds, also not a lot. But here we see this guy, um, that segment, taking about 3 seconds. So we now found the place in our code, this segment, where um, which is very imperformant. Yeah, and it is this, there is some code in here, which I put there also on purpose, that is very imperformant and that took three seconds to execute. So if we want to fix this thing, we need to fix our code right there. So we found our performance bottleneck. That's good. We used X-Ray to uh, pinpoint the poorly performing part of our system. And we were able to visualize our flow. X-Ray allows us to visualize the flow. Um, and from, that, from those visualizations, we were able to get the information that we needed. So we solved two out of the three challenges. Last one, that was testing our remote system. Remember I told you we could not run our whole system locally anymore because we now have all those cloud services that are 
being used. So when we make a change to our logic, to our application logic, um, we deploy again to our development environment, and then we have to test our system to see if it's still working as expected. So therefore, oh yeah, indeed, that's, the <laughs> in, that's it. in contrast with before, when we build monoliths or microservices on our machine, we run it on our machine and it works. And when it goes wrong, we just say like, hey, works on my machine, right? Now you cannot do that anymore. You have to test it in the cloud. So what do we need for that? If you wanna, if you updated the code, you redeployed, and you still want to test if the system is still working as expected, then you need to do some smoke testing or some system testing to see if the behavior is still what you want. So let's see about that. Huh? We want to know that if a request is coming in via the API, is a notification still being sent out? And we could, of course, do that by always manually entering a session and then looking at Slack, do we get a notification? But you don't want to do that. You want to automate that thing. And that is what I did here. Uh, um, I am mostly a Java developer, so I did it in Java. I used uh, JUnit for this, which is the Java, the, the testing framework. Um, and I made an automated test that pushed, uh, that pushed a new session in the API. And then I said, like, OK, yeah, you can wait around. You can wait around a little bit. And then you can wait around until the point that you get the session um, forwarded to you uh, via Slack. Now, of course, via Slack, I now set up uh, some HTTP endpoint somewhere. Um, a, wi a wire mock is that, which is mocking uh, the, the Slack service um, to see if a request is actually coming in. Are we actually forwarding this thing? So that is what we see here. We see that we send in a request, and then we are waiting, waiting for it until the notification comes to us. Uh, we're waiting a couple of seconds, uh, seven, eight, it's time that it comes. All right, we received the session. So now we know, we tested automatically that our flow is still working as it should. So for one request, this thing still works. Um, remember now, the wave, the wave that I also showed in the picture before, the flood of requests that we were going to send to our system which is the load test that we will perform. We also want to know uh, our system is behaving correctly when we send one request, but can it actually handle a lot of requests at the same time? No, the cloud is scalable, right? So it should. Yeah, you still should design the system the right way. Um, here I use the framework Artillery, which um, allows us to define a test, um, uh, define a load test. And here I defined something uh, where I started with entering one request per second, one session per second, and then I gradually upped it to 10 requests per second um, during, the, during a time of two minutes. So um, we flooded our landscape with a bunch of requests, and we now want to see the outcome of uh, th this load test. Uh, is the system able to handle that load? OK, again, I have a link here. Let me go there. I ran this system test. I think it was this, uh, this is a load test. I think it was last week somewhere. Um, take the right time range. Apply. Yep. OK, um, this is now going to show us the results of our load test. This here, this thing that we see here, is actually CloudWatch dashboards. It allows you to visualize the outcome of those queries that you write the queries that we wrote before, you can visualize the outcome of those queries. And what I visualized here in the first place is the response time of my Lambda function. Uh, the response time to the client. So if the client wants to create a session, how quickly do we answer him? And we see in the beginning it was a little higher. Yeah, that's because we have some cold starts in the beginning. And then we see a new peak here, which is weird. Huh? We, we, uh, we had the cold starts in the beginning, but I gradually added more and more requests per second. So it needed more and more Lambda functions to do this logic. So it spun up some extra Lambda functions, which also had a cold start. Um, and that's why we see that second peak. Below, we see that um, we actually got 357 seconds entered in our landscape. But from these, only 341 
we're actually uh, arriving in the select notification lambda function, which is the problem that we already found. Uh, we found that there was an exception um, appearing in our code. We see here that the DynamoDB lambda actually executed 392 times. That's because of that retry mechanism, right, that we saw. So even when it went wrong, the system is retrying. But most importantly, from our load test, I also measured again the slick notification delete time. So the time that it took for a request that came in until we send out a slack notification for it. And this time is huge, right? 220 seconds, that's like four minutes, four minutes to send out a request. What, what? Something is going on here. So now you have all the tools, you have your structured logging, you have X-ray, you could use this trace ID to dive deeper into your flow and to look at which parts that took a long time. Now, I already did this and I can tell you that here, um, actually in our landscape, we had um, a lambda function sending out the select notifications. And this lambda function uh, that, was, that was looking at the database, everything, something is saved in the database, I'm going to send out a select notification. One by one, once uh, every one or two seconds, depending on how long the call takes to select. Gradually sending this out, but we added 10 requests per second, you know. So many things were saved in the database, 10 per second, and we only forwarded one per second. So things are queuing up there. And these are the things that are uh, arriving, that arrived in the back of the queue, so that had to wait a long time to be forwarded to Slack. So even here, you have to know the services of the cloud, um, because uh, listening on, a dyna on changes of DynamoDB, it can only happen, uh, or it happened here with one Lambda function at the same time, so only one request was, se was, was sent out, and that's the problem here. So our load test actually led us to a new problem, and that's the point, that's why we want to do this load test. We want to see if our system is able to handle the load. Recapping what we did for our third challenge, mm, we made an automated smoke test to test the behavior of our system. Is it still working as expected? And we did a load test um, to see how does the system perform under load, and there we actually found that there was another problem, which is why you want to do this load test. Good. Uh, yeah. And we were able to visualize the results. And that's actually very useful, eh? CloudWatch, has those dashboards where you can, and you can save those dashboards, so you can create a dashboard that you can always use to visualize your results. And those dashboards, they are created from the queries that you write in Login Sites. Good. We had three challenges. The first one being finding the error in the distributed system. Therefore, we structured our logs. The logs were aggregated in CloudWatch Login Sites and we correlated our logs with the trace ID. Second one, we wanted to tackle performance bottlenecks, and we used X-Ray for that to get more, insights into, uh, more insight into the behavior of our system. And the third one was uh, we want to test our remote system, we want to test its behavior, we created a smoke test, we created a load test, and then we used CloudWatch Log Insights to visualize the result. Nice. With that, I end the second and the biggest part of the presentation. Now, going to third-party tools, which are actually an alternative for what I did just here. We saw that we had to do a lot of custom things, like uh, making those structured logs, which is coding. You have, actually, you have to configure the format of these structured logs. We uh, have to learn how to work with X-Ray, we have to write these queries in CloudWatch, then we have to create dashboards, things that cost time, and time is money. So you might also want to invest this money in, a, in another tool that does this for you. That's a consideration that you have to make yourself. Uh, I've only, uh, used, uh, I've also only used one tool for this, um, also for the, my personal projects, and that is called Lumigo, maybe some of you already were in the session. Eris, where are you sitting? Uh, here. Uh, you gave a session yesterday on Lumigo, indeed. Um, and they also are a sponsor here at the conference. So if you want more information about that, 
certainly go to their boot. Um, and Lumigo actually allows you to uh, monitor and troubleshoot your serverless application. And how does it do that? Well, at first you get uh, a high-level overview of all the errors that are appearing in your landscape. So this is a dashboard that's just giving a general overview. Uh, you do didn't have to write a query for this dashboard, it's just there. Um, mentioning, like, okay, man, at this point, 16% uh, of the requests uh, went, went in error. And then it allows you to dive deeper. Remember that we forwarded the trace ID to be able to correlate everything together. Well, that's also what we see here. We see that something came in via the API, uh, was then a Lambda function processed it, put it to an SNS topic, and then another Lambda function was working. So this is here visualized for us. And we can also see that something went wrong here. So if we click there, we can dive deeper into this and we are directly uh, in the logs where it went wrong. That's instead of uh, where we had to write some queries and uh, dive into manually. Pretty easy, right? Um, I also want to mention those two things, which are uh, completely free. So they have a CLI, which allows you to, for example, get the requests um, to, to get the information from your Lambda landscape, looking at which things are here costing me the most money which Lambda functions are uh, executing a lot and uh, are costing a lot. Next, to that, this is also open source. You can contribute to this yourself if you want to. They also have a best practices blog. Um, they recently, they have like the serverless monk working for them. Who knows the serverless monk? That's Jan Kui. Um, so he's working for those guys and uh, blogging at their blog mentioning a lot of the things that I also mentioned here will also be there uh, because it are some of the best practices for you to have more observability in your system. So check it out. Right, and now it's really time for wrapping up. Hmm? We saw structured logging and all the advantages that came with it. Next, uh, we saw that from these logs we could now read queries, uh, make queries and visualize the results of those queries in CloudStrush dashboards. Then we dove into the performance of our system and uh, looked at um, where is the system performing poorly with AWS X-Ray, which allowed us to get more insight in how, how quickly are we responding, um, how long is every part of our code taking. And then uh, we also saw how we have the need to test our remote system we did a smoke test to look if the system was still behaving as expected, and we did a load test to see if it was also performant under load. So, we now slate this guy, made your life easier, and you can go back to your hammock just chilling away in the weekend. No support, and if there is some support, you'll be able to figure it out quickly, right? Okay, and that's how I get to the end of the session. If you want to know more about the queries and the codes behind this, uh, or just want to read again what, what I just told you here, um, check out either one of these links, which will lead you to the blog post about this, or follow me on Twitter, it's also there. Um, and then we are all the way to the end, so I now see that we still have some time and I can take some questions. Are there any questions from the audience? No questions, which is great, because yeah, then I've made it clear. All right. See you guys. Thank you, and bye-bye.